Welcome to AI Cafe. My name is Lance Hart. I'm the producer. Today, we're going to be talking about five pitfalls to avoid during enterprise AI adoption. I have a couple guests here, and I'm going to turn it over to Brian Quinn for introductions. Thanks, Lance. Uh, I'm Brian Quinn, Senior Vice President in charge of product development, and I'm joined by Justin Grishop, Senior Director of Analytics and AI. Thanks for joining. And we're here today to talk about those five pitfalls that most companies will fall into. Yeah. All right. Gen AI is a very popular topic these days. Well, lots of companies are experimenting with AI, especially Gen AI. Enterprise companies are, you know, working on implementing it. And there, there are many companies that are, you know, finding it hard to implement. Lots of areas uh, for improvement in these implementations. We found uh, many, many ways that we could have improved in our, in our experiments as well. Yeah, there's, there's a lot going on in the space right now. We're seeing a lot of experimentation, some some projects making it to production. There's a lot of exploring capabilities, running into limitations, running into things that, oh, I wish we knew this going into this project. And we're seeing a lot of uh, organizations finding some success and finding failures in other ways. And you know, I think part of what we're gonna talk about here today are what are the, some of the common pitfalls that we see enterprises running into that if, if they had known ahead of time, maybe they would, would have approached their AI play in their AI projects uh, in a slightly different way. So if we can save some people some time just by shortcutting some of those painful lessons, I think it'll be time well spent. So Justin, let's just jump right into our, our, our first kind of pitfall. Sometimes just companies will, you know, implement uh, a generative AI or an AI solution without any training or without any, you know, user education or whatever. And uh, we've seen, I think, in many cases where you know, user adoption of something like that might happen, you know, for the first few days or the first week, and then it just drops off because they can't quite figure it out or, you know, the early adopters like it, but everybody else, it kind of drops off. Without the user education, you're, you're going to fall into that pit, definitely. And, you know, technology is just a piece of the pitfalls that we've, we've encountered, right, and that we've seen. Uh, it's definitely the people side of this is, plays a huge role. And I think that's a really important point. A lot of this a lot of this discussion is focused on the technology, but really it's how the technology is impacting people that matters the most because it's ultimately people who are going to need to adopt this technology and help bring this technology to fruition for each enterprise. And some research is showing that that change management itself is one of the most important aspects of AI adoption. And it's often one of the most overlooked aspects of AI adoption. Everyone wants to gravitate to the technology, to the capabilities, but you got to bring people along on that journey in order to, to ensure that you're really hitting success. Oh, yes, absolutely. This organizational change management piece of this, very important. The awareness, the desire, the knowledge, all of these pieces and more are really what would cause the user to adopt and use these things going forward. One of the first ways we saw organizations struggling to adopt AI was actually just turning it on. So turning on AI without going through any user training without going through user support, understanding that change management motion inside of your organization and what it took to educate people and bring them along. That was a really strong predictor of failure uh, from some of the some of the initial conversations we had early on. There, there's a lot to cover here. Technology is a piece of it. People is a piece of it. And really how these two come together is, is where the, the magic happens. The technical people who love it and maybe use ChatGPT every day say, hey, just turn it on. Everybody's going to love it. That's just not how it works. You know, they, they talk about prompt engineering and all of that fun stuff. Just the prompts alone. It's daunting for some people who don't know how to use it. So just throwing it out there is, is not a good idea. And you can see where the some of the hype comes from because you've got really early adopters who are excited about the technology. They're going out to chat GPT. They were probably there November of 2022 uh, running some initial prompts and seeing what this magic uh, actually looked like. But you've got others who are entering this conversation in uh, entirely new ways and you've really got to bring everybody along on, on that journey. I think end user support and, and making sure that your organization's prepped for change management is a big piece of that. You know, it's, it's, it's as easy as turning on a license, potentially for something like Microsoft Copilot. You can throw it out there, turn it on and say, hey, it's ready, it's available to you. It's now available to you in Microsoft Word and Microsoft uh, PowerPoint and so forth. Uh, and you'll see that it gets adopted, you know, the first few days, and then you'll see adoption drop off, especially if they don't really know how to use it or how to leverage it. You really should at least get some training out there. Um, 
if not actually really spend some time in, in use cases in those specific business units and how those business units might use that and leverage it more. Some larger organizations who are and who are debuting AI technology are even going as so far as to suggest, well, you should understand the persona of the person who's going to be using it. So you should really get down to the role, to the function, help, help them understand what's a day in the life look like and how can how can this technology help you? Because even with some of the some of the more expensive uh, technology that that's coming out, the the ROI is there. I mean, the 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 uplift on productivity if you know how to utilize the technology is there for for a lot of users and for a lot a lot of organizations. But you've really got to get your you got to get your foot in the door by helping people see that this is an enhancement to what I'm doing on a day to day basis, not necessarily a replacement for my job. Don't just throw it out there and assume that people are going to use it and use it uh, appropriately inside of the organization. Uh, so jumping into our next uh, pitfall, if you will, or trying to avoid jumping into that pitfall, what happens if you really don't have a data governance policy? I know it's talked about a lot uh, all over the place, as a matter of fact, but, you know, what is that pitfall? What happens if you don't have that? Or, you know, what happens when you start sharing data incorrectly? Most organizations would balk at the idea of sharing corporate secrets with, with their competition, but it's never been easier to share data and in fact, it's never been easier to share data in an innocent way if you're an end user yeah. trying to access information. Yeah. I think it's easy to uh, lose data both internally and externally. Can you think of some examples like that? Sure, sure. I mean, so maybe an internal example would be, you know, a very tired finance manager was working late one night, shared a file out to a SharePoint uh, that had everybody's salary in it. And it just happened to be in the wrong SharePoint that had the wrong access. All of a sudden, Everybody's got the ability to search salaries for the entire company. It can literally be that easy to share the wrong information and expose the wrong information to the entire organization. I know we just talked about educating business users, and that's that's part of part of both implementing a governance policy as well as, as educating business users because you have to help people understand the power of the technology doesn't just increase your possibilities; it increases your risk. By potentially exposing the wrong data to uh, to the organization, um, perhaps it's uh, stale data, perhaps it's sensitive data, you can really put yourself at a disadvantage and potentially your, your business at risk uh, by not having the right governance policies in place. And that's just talking about internal uh, governance policies, yeah. not even ex external. Yeah. Then yeah. we've talked a little bit before about like, some of the external cases where data has been shared inappropriately. I know you've got some. Yeah, like, some one of those early examples uh, was uh, Samsung, you know, an engineer just sharing some data innocently just to get some summary information or compare it to some code um, and just shared it out there. And it became part of a knowledge base that everybody could see. And, and Samsung themselves lost millions of dollars in intellectual property uh, based on that. Right. And it can e easily be done if you don't have the right policy and the policy isn't, you know, you don't provide the examples to your employees of what is shareable, what isn't shareable. Yeah, so that, that's policy and training Biden you in a second. That, that probably occurred over the course of minutes. So $10 million plus right out the door because you're sharing code that was proprietary sensitive and really shouldn't have gone out into the wild just like that. Yep. And who's to say that maybe even a senior vice president might not share a accidentally a word doc that he shouldn't <laughs> share if he didn't know that he wasn't supposed to do it. Right? Yeah, sure. So. I mean, that's the power of the, that's the power of, of these tools is, you know, you can leverage something like a chat GPT, perform a meaningful analysis in a snap. And the temptation, I think, for people, especially people who are really focused on delivering value or perhaps under a tight deadline, they'll, they'll want to move quickly. They will want to get the most out of their data. And there could be a temptation or just a general lack of knowledge on what you can and should share into these systems. And if you're not careful, you really can expose some critically sensitive information. So definitely develop that AI governance policy and data sharing policy more sooner than later. Yes, and educate your users on it. And educate your users on that. Hey, I just did a query in ChatGPT and your guy's salary is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Could be a little bit higher, I think. <laughs> It seems like uh, these LLMs take a lot of data to, to learn in the first place and uh, still hallucinations exist and all of that fun stuff. And now that you're inside of the enterprise and, and leveraging these types of tools, sure seems 
to be the case that bad data in is bad data out at the same time. Understanding your data um, sure seems to be uh, a pitfall if you don't understand your data. And if you have bad data, you're going to get bad data out of your out of your your implemented systems as well. Garbage in, garbage out just went exponential with generative AI because you're able to perform rapid analysis on your data in ways that have been previously basically impossible, where previously you may have had a person looking at and looking at your data sets and saying, hey, this, this doesn't quite make sense. That happens all the time in analysis. In fact, a, a good bulk of the work that's done by BI and analytic teams is actually cleaning the data. It's less analyzing the data, it's, it's more cleaning the data. If you're not working from a clean data set, then you're, you're potentially analyzing correctly and you're gonna get the wrong answer. It's not gonna be very obvious right off the bat that that's happening, but that just touches on the analysis. Companies need to be looking at their processes and their people and their systems in a, in a much deeper way to ensure that the information that they're feeding into these AI systems is accurate. And that's probably one of the things that we've seen go potentially wrong for an enterprise, but also where there could probably be more prep being done today. It's not just about clean data and everything, but it's actually knowing where your data is and the data sources and where, where they are, right? Absolutely. So. You've got to start with your sources, understand where your information's coming from. You've got to actually examine the individual data points to ensure that you've got appropriate degrees of quality that will service and analysis in, a, in an automated way. Because as we just talked about, if you're, you can rapidly analyze data, but if the data is wrong, yeah, you're going to rapidly uh, permeate very incorrect answers. Getting your systems in ready for this tech, technological wave is actually a really valuable thing you can be doing right now. Not all use cases that, that we're envisioning as an industry are going to come to fruition in the next six months. Although in the next two to three years, it's a very real possibility that we're looking at a very, very powerful tech stack. One of the best things that enterprises can be doing and one of the, thing, one of the areas we see them consistently struggling in is poor quality data. So getting your, your knowledge repos in shape, getting the information uh, systems that, are, that you intend to feed AI in shape is one of the most proactive and valuable things you can be doing in this moment in order to get ready to adopt AI as a, as a core competency of your organization. Understanding where they are, understanding that the data is clean is, is a place to be even before your journey begins. Absolutely, and, and if you try to go into the journey without taking some of those prerequisite steps, you're gonna run into this anyway, right? The, that's really where being prepared now is going to pay dividends in the future because the name of the game moving forward is going to be about speed and productivity. Organizations that are that are maximizing their productivity and their and their value channels to their customers are going to be the ones that thrive and get ahead. If you want to prepare for that for that next leg of this journey, getting your data, getting your systems, your processes and your people all aligned is really what's going to make the difference between jumping ahead and maybe falling behind. Right. So speaking of speed, um, you know, one of the one of the advantages of generative AI is is really in the, in the world of coding, right? And its ability to generate code faster than anything else. So introducing generative AI in inside of your CI CD pipelines can be great. It can also be a major pitfall. Absolutely, right? lots of technical teams are picking up enormous speed by leveraging AI for code, code development, code checking. Going back to what we talked about and ensuring what code you're actually sharing is absolutely applicable here. But right now, I think we're talk talking about speed. If you don't think your teams aren't using it, you're probably wrong. They're absolutely <laughs> using it. They're absolutely using it. And if you if you haven't seen a pro pickup in productivity, that's a different conversation. <laughs> yeah, a lot of organizations are seeing upwards of 40% um, increase from their from their development teams in terms of overall speed. And that's great. As a practitioner of this, you can you can see how applicable generative AI is to code creation, code development, et cetera. Increasing the velocity of your, your pipeline can be fantastic, but it can mean you're increasing the velocity of the bugs you're introducing into the system as well. One of the things that we implemented early on was code checks before pushing anything to production. A lot of organizations have this, but if you don't have stringent code checks now, you really, really need to consider implementing them today and immediately because 
your technical teams are using generative AI in order to develop out their code base. And it is very easy to introduce mistakes um, if you're if you're moving quickly with um, without code checks. So absolutely, you should be following best practices on your CICD pipelines and you should be um, toll gating this this work with at least one level of oversight before pushing to production. Kind of curious if you have any kind of real world examples. I, mean, I, don't I have know. a personal example <laughs> and I, I'm not I'm not too proud to share it. You know, when when <laughs> chat GPT first came out, I was working really late one night. I'd been working all day on an analysis for an SVP. It was, it was, it was, it wasn't you. It wasn't you. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't you. I had been working all day. It was probably 11 PM. It was a, it was a Friday. And I was, I was just at the point where my, the mental overhead had been heavy and I was running out of, uh, of mental capacity. And I put a prompt into chat GPT again. This was right when it first came out, it came back with a recommendation on some code. It looked pretty good. You know, I thought for, I thought, you know, just first pass, it looked, it looked all right. I went in, I put it into my model and my instinct just said, something's off here. And thank goodness it did. Because if I had implemented that change into my model, it would have literally said the opposite of the truth. That freaked me out personally on a professional and personal level so much so that I, I was very gun shy even to leverage uh, generative AI for, uh, for coding for a little while, because I, I'd come very close to producing a very incorrect analysis. And I know this can happen. This, uh, this can happen to any developer uh, along the way, but it's very important that as an organization, you're aware of these types of dynamics because people will uh, leverage, <laughs> they will leverage uh, AI in order to develop out their code base. And you've got to be very careful when you do so. Right. Yep. So Justin, at the pace that this is changing, the industry is changing, this gen AI industry is changing. I think lock-in probably seems to be something to avoid as well. So, you know, one of those major pitfalls is probably lock-in. It could be vendor lock-in, it could be data lock-in. And there's um, a lot, and a lot of different pieces of applications that are coming out there. Lots and lots of vendors saying use their code or their snippets or their application. Enterprises are looking at entrance into this into this field. Um, there's lots of long-term players that have new applications that are out there. Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Tesla, <laughs> Xi, I guess. Um, what do we do as, a, as an enterprise in choosing which applications or who do we, who do we place bets on for you know, our enterprise? And it's a big question. It's a great question. There's thousands and thousands of applications coming online on a monthly basis with new AI focuses, new AI capabilities. Some are just a wrapper for ChatGPT. Some are a little bit more sophisticated. Some are entire platforms. But what we're seeing though, as, as OpenAI it really serving as kind of the heartbeat of the industry at the moment. I know there's other fast followers, but OpenAI is ser serving as the heartbeat of the industry. Their speed and their development pace is putting a lot of these businesses out of business before they really even get started. A study found that 70% of AI startups were out of business within the first year. And that was based off of OpenAI's development speed a year ago. Um, when you're looking at potential vendors, you really got to be careful about who you're signing up with uh, in the long term. In fact, there's been a push um, for AI apps and AI uh, businesses to lock in customers into long-term contracts because they're literally seeing them cycle out in months as the capabilities of the industry are moving so quickly. And so you've got to really be careful when you're evaluating which vendors you want to, to follow into the space. Uh, you know, our general guidance has been invest in the companies who are investing the most into the space because the pace of innovation is going to make it very difficult for smaller players to keep up. Not saying don't sign contracts with them, just saying exercise a lot of caution and long-term contracts if you're not positive that the company you're working with has the staying power. There, there might be advantage to proof of concepting or piloting something from uh, a, a vendor that, that solves a problem that you might have, a special problem that you might have. But it, there are odds that well, some of these larger providers, some of these more, call it incumbent enterprise players, will probably call it gobble that up or provide that as a feature down the road. 
Sam Altman has basically said that is his strategy. So he's, he's actively pursuing the development of generative AI to the degree that these fringe use cases effectively become consumed uh, through OpenAI's platform. And I think what we've seen too uh, as well is that um, one of the, the major investors in um, this from an early onset was somebody like Microsoft, uh, who hasn't historically always been a leader in, in innovation necessarily. Uh, but when it came to this AI strategy, uh, they were an early adopter, a heavy investor, heavy investor in open AI as well, and made a big shift internally in their organization as well. Do you think that they are a decent investment or strategy, long-term strategy? Someone at Microsoft made a really wise decision when when they decided to work with OpenAI, and it's it's paying dividends. What we're seeing from a tooling perspective is Microsoft seems to be very ahead of the game, not just in terms of what they're doing from an AI capabilities standpoint, but also how it's all integrating. Microsoft is working on the full suite of how AI will lift up the entire enterprise, and there's others who are as well. But as of right now, Microsoft is ahead. So, you know, that could change. The market's moving very quickly. But Microsoft is a really good example of an organization when we say, put your money behind those who have the staying power and proven staying power. From our calculus, Microsoft is definitely one of those vendors and there's others. The application and lock-in with these vendors is important, but maybe even more important is where your data resides and locking in your data to some place or some company where you might not get your data back. This is one of the most important points, not just for this moment in time, but also for your organizational strategy moving forward. There's a lot of research that already coming out that's showing that your data is going to be your competitive edge moving forward. The last thing you want is to have your data residing in some system where it doesn't belong to you or where you're unable to access it. You should be working to the best of your capabilities with open standards and environments where you own your data, you're able to migrate in, you're able to migrate out, and you're able to leverage your data for your own AI capabilities and core competencies. Don't let your competitive advantage become someone else's. And we've definitely seen where there are certain vendors out there that definitely want to hold on to your data and it's written into contracts where they hold your data. So pay attention to some of those types of vendors who will want to do that type of thing to you. Yes. You want to avoid that significantly. Yeah, we, we came close at one point uh, to just that situation. And thankfully we caught it in our toll gates. Uh, but it, had we gone down that direction, one of our most valuable data sets would have effectively been locked in with this vendor and getting it back would have been almost impossible. So it really, and, and this is a, it's a very real concern. It's a very real risk. And it's something you should be paying a lot of attention to. So what we covered five major pitfalls. I'm sure there's probably others. Uh, these are ones that we've had experience in. Hopefully our viewers won't encounter these. Making sure that we educate the business users before we roll these things out or while we're rolling these things out, uh, they're not going to adopt them in, unless they actually understand what's in it for them. Uh, making sure that there is a data sharing policy, a governance policy in place. Making sure you understand your knowledge repositories, making sure your data is clean even before your AI project or generative AI project begins. If you are actually doing application development, making sure that you have stringent code checks if you're doing any generative AI. And finally, definitely avoiding any type of vendor lock-in, whether it's application or your data, which is very important to you. So Justin, I wanna say thanks for joining me this session and uh, we'll probably catch you the next time. Yeah, great being here. Thanks, Brian. And thanks everybody for joining the AI Cafe.